Hello everyone, welcome to the AOI Streams, in-depth conversations with digital artists and experts to explore how blockchain technology is impacting the future of art. AOI, also known as Art on Internet, is the movement for emerging arts and technology. I'm Federica and today I'll be your host. On this new episode of Inner Code Masterclasses, generative artist Martin Grasser shows us the development of his career as well as his new project Love. Also joining us today, Martin's agent, Tony Marinara from Artex Code and Mark Epps from ATP. Um, let's start uh, with a little chat about how you started in the art field. How did your career start? When did you get interested in art to begin with? And how did you get then into generative art, for example? Um, yeah, I'll try and go through this fast. I mean, I, I grew up drawing. That was sort of like my my little thing I could do in grade school. Um, and my father can draw and, um, and paint. Um, but we, he, there was not, um, like there's a lot of representational work in, in our house. And uh, I, I think it was just like a, it was sort of a way, uh, like an outlet, I guess, for me as a kid. Um, and so I was interested in art, but I, we didn't have any like family friends or anybody who was like a graphic artist or anything. So I really did not know this was all like any of this stuff was a job. I thought like you were either like a painter and, um, like, I, I just didn't know these extensions into art existed. Um, and so I met my, uh, when I met my wife, her job was, uh, kerning headlines for Condé Nast. And I didn't even know what that meant, but it's the space between letters for headline typography. And um, at some point, I started painting a lot in my house, and my wife was like, "You should go back to art school." And I, and I ended up back at Art Center. Um, and the first day, I I audited a type class with a woman named Leah Hoffmitz, who had a massive impact on my artistic career, and. Um, she showed the class in Emil Ruder book, um, who's like a one of the founding, I don't know, whatever figures of typography of a certain style of typography. And I, um, from there, I just, I fell in love with, uh, for me, that was like my way in. I could draw, but I was, I was a little bit not interested in producing like one illustration that did not seem like a, the idea sort of fell flat for me a little bit. Like I could draw really well, but I wasn't interested in like, I see this, I draw this. That's what drawing was to me. And, but when I discovered that type, um, those, that, that was a job to draw letters. And then I think it's the distribution of that like system, the function of that, the function of a drawing became like really interesting to me. Started studying systems, started for a really natural extension for me in graphic design was brand identity and understanding how systems are used to build communications at scale. And that became very interesting to me. The texture of typography became very interesting to me. Um, I'm dyslexic. So I think I had a, an even deeper interest in, in type because I think the, again, like, you know, the margin on the page is as interesting as the page itself, like the space in between the columns. Um, how, what, what point size is the type, how much is in, in between the lines. And I think that sort of connected everything for me in terms of like systems and artwork. Um, Cause I saw it as art, I saw it as shape. Um, and then I had a way to go make a career out of it because this was not happening yet, what we're in the middle of right now. And so I started, I think at one, and you know, at one point I was studying like really formal typography and really formal design, but at the same time studying like um, um, conceptual artists like Alan McCullum and things like that, and what they were doing with shapes and um, and repetition and form. And then you think about how repetitive the alphabet is, you know, I mean, like that is, that's a repetition, that's a multiple. And I think that became um, really interesting to me. And I think when you begin to mix those two of taking like the function of the alphabet and mixing that with abstraction, um, now, now I'm like really interested. And I think that's kind of where I am now. So really for me, it was like getting to art school and finding type and that was a major unlock for me in terms of like the way I like to make work. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for 
introduced in that. And um, you were mentioning you know, typography. And I know that one of the things that has been always very important to you connected to that is language, right? You were telling me that you love you know, taking the language, breaking it apart, and then rebuild it again, right? So mm-hmm. what is language for you? I mean, I guess, you know, for me, I see it as a system and I see it as all, I see it as like a hundred things or something like that. I guess I see it as um, the shapes of the letters, the shapes of the word, the spaces in between, the shape of a sentence, the shape of a paragraph, um, how that fills up a page, what the margin is like. I think all of those things are like an opportunity to communicate. Um and I think that language is anything that you can break down into parts and then re rebuild. And I think like, I've always, um, I think I've been very interested in the abstract, um, taking things that are abstract and rebuilding, um, like rebuilding abstractions. I mean, square, the art blocks project is a way of taking a simple, one simple shape, almost like a you know, piece of typography, like a square monospace piece of typography and using repetition and layering. Um, the tennis project in a way is a form of um, retaking things apart and rebuilding them just with different colors and different, you know, shades or whatever and treating it as like a little bit more of a construction um, project. So I think to me, when we go through some of the work later, I, you know, I think they'll all feel like projects where it's not like, de- I wouldn't say it's like I deconstruct things, but I really do think of them like mapping it to the keyboard and then how do we use that as a way of calling color or calling shape or calling something different than a letter and language. I love that. And I look forward for later to to go through um, all of this as well so that you know, we have an idea as well for, for our audience. But just so we stay in the kind of like conceptual side still, you were also telling me the other day that um, some of your key concepts in your work are repetition, translation, and systems, like you were saying right now. So can you tell us um, how how they are represented in your work? And if you can expand on this, why would you why would you choose these three concepts? Um, I mean, <laughs> I think it's one of those things where like they choose you or something. I mean, I think it's just um it's the thing I keep exploring. Um I think um, repetition has always had a way of sort of setting my brain on fire. I can remember being really young and seeing Warhol in like seventh or eighth grade and really responding to that idea. And there's something about seeing the same thing different. I really love the idea of giving people optionality in paintings. Like I, again, going back to like the one like drawing one thing, I'm more interested in creating a system of paintings that allows everybody to get the color they want. And so I was really interested in that repetition. I also think things become more interesting um, when they begin to sit next to each other, they change, you know, like one is a thing, two is a pair, three is a, three is on balance, four is a pattern, five begins to become like you know, what is it when it's at 5 million? What is it when 500 million? Like all of a sudden the scale of a thing can really change it. So repetition, I'm interested in things that are the same, but different. Um, translation, I would say is just a form of repetition. I think, again, if you look at a lot of my project, I mean, even the the tennis court is a, is a translation. It's just turning, taking the, the court and turning it on its angle and you know, flipping it and um, turning it a color. And so I think translation to me is really a way of making people focus harder on what you're doing because it's familiar. There's still like a level of like, oh, that's definitely a tennis court, but it's fluorescent yellow. Or like, like that's definitely a newspaper, but it's completely illegible because it's in a dot font. And so I like translation as a way of like obscuring a communication and forcing people to look a little, like take a second look. And then systems, I just, I really like not, I really like setting up systems. I think it's my, what I like to design. I think it's actually my like art form. I don't, I I know generative art is like the the word, but I would call myself like a systems artist. I, I don't think everything I do starts with code. Um, I want to create a system in which we can create 
um, positive outcomes artistically. And like, that's up to me aesthetically, like what that positive outcome is. But like, I get more joy out of designing the system with a team and a group. Um, yeah, that's, that's just like, I, I don't know how else to say it. I think that's, that's my art form is designing systems. I, it's, it's not only what I'm interested in, it's how I work. That's awesome. That's that's really great. And I love that you started with, you know, um, language and typography and then as a language, typography as a language and, you know, kind of like reshaping letters and, and really translating it into something new. And then now you're moving into a system where you are taking a language, in this case, kind of sports. We can say that it's sort of language, you know, it's a system on its own sure. and kind of remake it again so i i really look forward to see this kind of process um that got you there uh, if it's okay with you i would start with the the screen sharing part uh, where you can walk us through sure. some of your reports sure um let me just pull up a few things real quick and and i may need to pull up a deck here or there um but i was gonna start a little bit with um some of the work that led me here and then we can okay. chat about oh i need you to um enable me to share please all right thank you should be able oh. to know thank you i think one thing you were just saying is really interesting um, about like built i think there's a lot of answers in how the systems like break like when you're building the systems, I think, again, working with team like Tony, Mark, whoever it is we're working with, Audrey, Arsh and Lach, um, like it's really fun to, there's a lot to be learned in sort of what doesn't work in the system. And I really enjoy how that guides the work as you go to. Um, so let's see, uh, I'm just going to go through some of my work. I think it's easiest for me to talk about my work and i um, happy to, I can't see any questions. Um, so just feel free to stop yeah. at any point. I'm happy to answer questions. So again, like my work is really about um, systems. And I think like, I really like when systems break. This to me is when art starts to get interesting. And so I think most of my work is built around this idea. I would say we have a systems driven process focus on abstraction and translation to generate a diverse evolving body of work. And so again, for me, everything starts here. I think this is like my, my door in to, to the world of art. The fact that like, this is a shape and carries meaning, I think is like, was the big unpacking for me um, that allows that kind of sits at the center of most of my ideas. And I think early on, even here, you can see this idea of variety and variation. I think the idea that these two, these five drawings represent the same thing is really compelling to me. Um, even layering them on top of each other and changing them, you can see that the skeleton is the same, but the meaning remains. Um, like the skeleton is the same, the drawing changes, but the meaning remains. Like I'm really compelled by this. Like that's a super abstract A. Um, to me, and I'm really compelled that that like still holds water. And then I think when you do that at scale and disseminate that into language, I think that begins to become even more interesting to me. What is the texture of a paper? What is the texture of typography? What color does it hold? What is the shape of a text? What does that tell us about something? And so you asked me to talk a little bit about like, I tried to pepper in a few, um, inspirations here and people that I really looked up to and like I think changed the way I think about art and um this is a guy named Wolfgang Weingart he just passed away um and he is one of my favorite typographers he has a great book called my way to typography Swiss graphic designer who kind of went in and broke the rules of like quote unquote Swiss typography and he had like three rules that I, I read his book and I really I can't even know if I remember but it's like don't copy work fast and i can't remember the third rule but i like those two um <laughs> and um i just appreciate the immediacy of his work and the lack of preciousness i think that like i love how active his work is for something that's supposed to be like typographical and like there's no difference to me between image and text here they've like completely dissolved into each other 
And then that led to another one of my favorite groups, this group called um, 8VO, which is a group of um, British typographers um, from the 1980s. And they started to, again, in my mind, really, um, I began to see this as, as typography as image. And again, when these two things begin to dissolve into each other, I think that's when I start to get really compelled. And the other thing I love here is how they are modulating two-dimensional space. Like I think I see flat space more than I see three-dimensional space. And I think the way they are activating like a page and doing all the things with like margin, positive, negative, um, color, scale, uh, column width, you know, like these things are really moving. And I think here, these are some of the records that they did for factory records. And I think what really gets me excited here is how typography is leading the charge. Like not only is the type image, it's also pushing the form. It's dictating form, either carving out or like pushing out on the left and then carving out on the right. And I think like I, there's something in here for me that is, um, I mean, you can almost see the shape of some of the work in the squares work um, on the right hand side in terms of like the rectangles and the shapes of text, whether that's pixelated typography scaled up or little typography carving out these cannons in this red field that, um, you know, for me, this was like, I couldn't get enough of it. Um, and so this is kind of what I took into xerography. And this was sort of like my introduction to, you know, generative art. I think um, I got a photo, I got a code to the photocopier and um, I just started going crazy. And I was working on this Ryko and that little, that little interface right there is basically an algorithm. I think, um, you know, right now we look at algorithms on art blocks or whatever, and we're starting to see like, how the work is generated. And this was the same thing. The zoom went from 15 to 400. I could invert, I could build a pattern. I could do all these different things. So the exercise I went through was to start with one black square. And so when you press copy like this, again, same, but different, this is repetition. This is translation. This is now a system. So starting with one black square, how do you build a language? And so invert, stretch, shrink, enlarge, distort, stamp, build a pattern out of all these different things. And so you start to see what one black square can become on a photocopier. So this is the black square that's been inverted, stretched, shrunk, enlarged, built into a pattern, built into these different sets. And out of that, then you can start to, again, like now we're, we're building and we're drawing with a photocopier. So you can start to see these sets that I'm able to build like on a Xerox machine and they can be really simple. They can become increasingly complex. And again, when we start to say when the system breaks, I think this is what gets interesting to me because what's interesting here is not only the repetition, but then the break in pattern or the error, like on that third one over, you start to see like that line where um, the pattern starts again and there's a like an error in the photocopier because it's scaled too big or something. And to me, this is typography. There is a line in between the type, you know, a pica wide or whatever before you start information again on one side or the other. And so this is just a layout, you know? And then I think now we start to see analog coming into play though here and where we start to see these imperfections start to show up and the ghosting, um, of the previous copy, maybe sticking um, through the toner onto a piece of paper and how beautiful the grade eight, the gradation becomes here with the errors. And then big, you know, I think like, again, this is dry electrostatic toner transfer adhering to different types of papers. So like what is supposed to be a flat gray or flat black gets all this like movement and imperfection that just like, you know, to me was really um, stunning and beautiful starting to put them back through multiple times here. So the paper is going through more than one times. Um, Toner is running low. That got really exciting when that happened. You can see how beautiful, I mean, like look how much information is in there, just in like starting from one black square again and like building up this library to create this, this, you know, this sort of language. And then I think here you've got multiple passes, multiple blacks, the, the toner streaking um, not showing up. Um, all this, you know, fun, uh, to me, at least like really interesting results. Uh, one so question that, before but, you, sorry, one question before you move on, but did you, 
Did you start at a certain point wanting to manipulate the machine? I don't know, changing ink, um, maybe, um, I don't know, uh, uh, adding something in, into the ink or anything like that? Or, or did you let no. the machine do the whole, all of the evolution part? I was getting so much cool feedback and, you know, from me, just, I think even in the toner, I was loading all different types of papers, you know, and it like, again, this is pre, this was like a, I found a machine just lucky enough that wasn't digital. So this is like a metal plate heating up with electrostatic toner adhering to that plate. And then so the paper was even handling it different ways. I have ones where you can see my fingerprints in it, where like the dust completely fell off. And I think it's a lot, it's almost a lot like art blocks for me, where it's like, um, I needed rules. I really needed um, some like edges up on stuff to be able to like make, make work. I don't know. Like, yeah, it was enough for me. I don't know. Like I love the black and white. I love the way the paper was behaving. And um um, I'm trying to actually buy one of these machines, maybe with my tennis money, um, go buy, go buy one um, and get it in the, but it was a black and white machine and it was great. I loved it, you know, um, but anyway, I mean, yeah, it would be fun to play with color. I just don't know that I would get the same, whatever dissolving ink or, or toner or whatever that feeling was. Um, but I kept playing, you'll see here, I kept going with the, um, the photocopier. So again, I think a big thing you'll see in my work is like news. Again, it's typography, it's translated, it's every day. Um, and so I went and bought newspapers from around the world from one day. I was really interested in this idea of again, like a multiple and this idea that like, we all live obviously in the same world, but then like news can be reported differently in different places and this idea of like what happens when you begin to push this together um and so i basically took these newspapers back to the photocopier and started making this art out of news and so like you see here on the left like one word blown up like massively and then in the middle that's like korean classified ads shrunk down by like ten thousand percent and then on the right hand side, you see sort of like a collage of a couple different newspapers um, on yellow paper. And then even playing with the physicality on the left hand side, again, you can see like newspapers held vertically on the photocopier and then sh uh, some shredded newspaper there. And then zooming into one inch of an image that had some lanterns in it. Um, and then beginning to be more aggressive with like how many times this would go through, how many languages we would put um, into the newspaper. Um, and it's this idea of like, what does news look like when it gets collapsed and like crunched down? And then we even took those newspapers and like um, put them on a bandsaw. So like, I think it was like maybe 30 newspapers, something like that, and like began to carve out the idea of like a new letter form, almost this idea of like, what is a global, what could a global letter form be? And almost trying to reference all the different letter forms that we had just like been looking at in the newspaper. So we had a really fun exhibition. People were asked to like come touch the art and everything. Cause it was like, it really was crazy soft but we wanted it to be like a newspaper where like you could pick it up. And then I was also interested in like a couple things around the news um, as I have been handling so much newspaper thinking about what the newspaper you read, what it says about you and how the news you consume is just like something that we all go get. Um, it's a form of comfort, like tell me the news I want to hear. And so I started picking up newspaper from around the world. And so this is an FT page. And again, I think being somebody who doesn't read really, um, I listen to audible books, but I don't really read. And, um, but I think I've always been compelled by these shapes, like the important shapes of the newspaper and of the information that we get that like shapes everything. So started by erasing everything and then playing with this idea of like, well, what if it was like a flag? It almost began to feel like, or what if you could fill in content with those structural shapes? So you see like the big black bar on the left or the red from above left, bringing that down or some of those bars that are sitting there on the bottom of that ad. Um, and pulling that forward and okay, I'm, I'm an FT reader. What does that say about me? And like thinking about these ideas of 
these are my allegiances. Like I think of that as sort of a financial conservative newspaper. I don't know if that's right, but that's kind of what I think of it as. And then iterating on that and like thinking about how I can fill those spaces with those shapes and replace the content. Cause I, I, like, it's all, I don't know, sort of decorative anyway. And then again, taking, I guess I'm really, I, you know, I keep going back to this idea of form and content. Like I'm super interested in this space, like, and I push all the way towards form. I'm really compelled by form. And, um, and so this is a Chinese newspaper. Again, you can see there's a lot of editorial decisions, but what happens when you erase everything there? And then how's that full spread look? And again, so you see these familiar shapes of news, but all the information is missing. So is it, I think of this as a painting, you know? Um, but again, like the news as a ready-made, I think is like a way to think about it or like the shapes of our day as a ready-made or information. Started layering them on top of each other. This is a Japanese newspaper in a USA Today. Um, some of the outputs I started to put together around this project, around layering them on top of each other. I was also playing around with this in the context of the web, like I built a little plugin um, that would erase the newspaper and keep erase the typography, but keep the images still playing with this idea. I would love for like to build something where people could submit their own headlines. I think that's interesting. And then again, when we get to this idea of sort of like breaking all this stuff apart and rebuilding it. So then I started to like trace these. I started to take these as ideas as like starting points for news. And I started to trace those and build those into my own like graphic pattern library and languages and start to like rebuild the news almost like, okay, what does it look like if you redisseminate it? Like if you crunch it back up and I was thinking about how news gets disseminated today and these almost feel like Twitter portraits or how we consume news through our day of like this, this information, these shapes being like chopped up, spit out into these little pieces and being disseminated into these structures. Um, that kind of inform us and um, like move us throughout our day. And like, then you think about pages that may be more black and white, like classifieds or financial pages. Um, so that's sort of my news section. And then that takes us into type where I wanna get into some of the type tools. Any questions before I jump into sort of the type world? I'm just mind blown right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm really <laughs> taking everything in. It's It's absolutely great. Um, I don't think we've received any questions so far from the audience. We had a lot of feedback and comments. People are loving the session. Um, we have, yeah, just a couple of comments so far, but uh, please continue. We'll... The, first, the first time Marty ever took us at Artex Code through this presentation, <laughs> Sophie and I were just like, what the hell? This guy's a genius. Like our mind <laughs> was blown. I mean, I'm so happy to see Federica, you so excited in the comments here on the Discord about this process and, you know, others such as Lars and Luke, you know, reacting to this, because I think it's super important to see all of the work that goes into what Marty does, because, you know, at the end of the day, maybe you just see a square, which in itself is gorgeous. But when you see the nooks and crannies and all these little pieces that brought it together and how Marty finds the beauty in what others would regard as the mundane. It's just, it's incredible. So I'll shut up now, but. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> no, no, please uh, feel free to jump in at any time. It's, it's absolutely right. Like we, when we had the call the other day, I was already mind blown, but, um, you know, going through all of this, I'm just like, I'm speechless now. I just want to keep watching this. <laughs> You guys are like, you know, too nice. Come on. Uh, there's so many talented artists and like, it's fun to, you know, like I told, I, if Lars is saying nice things, like, you know, just trying to keep up. Um, but let's go into type because I think this has had a major influence and shaped a lot of the work um, as well. And I do think like, it's important to remember that like um, there was, you know, long time before people were interested in the art that we had to find a way to do stuff. So going back to my favorite letter, the lowercase a, and thinking about this translation, we spent, you know, a long time working on these typefaces. Um, so this is 188 Sans. This is available at Future Fonts. I don't think it's that. I can't remember how much we charge, but it's not that, that much. Great typeface. Um, also has like that pixelated version. And so this occupied the studio 
And um, my collaborator, uh, Zrinka Buyabasic and Jen Ramirez, who are both in Guadalajara, who help run the Type Foundry and are incredibly talented type designers and push this forward. We also worked with Courier. And so like, I think, you know, it's just important, like for me, like this is basically an interpretation for me of, of Arial. And so like my, I'm really interested in starting with these default fonts um, that are in the browser. And so this is, Arial is based off a typeface called Monotype Grotesque. Um, so we started there and with Arial and really wanted to build this familiar language, but something that also like pushed into other territories here. So I think again, we're seeing like pixelation and these other typefaces here as like multiples or vari variants. You know, I think like same idea as art for us here. And then this is our courier version. But again, with a twist, we have like this really cool reverse contrast. And I think part of what this does for you is like the amount of hours spent inside type design software. And I really try and leverage that in the way that I make art. And so I think that like, you know, all these letters and the way we produce the production or approach the production of type um, give you a way of thinking um, in the production of, of, of like gen art. And I think that like, when you listen to everybody else talk about, oh, I spent a, you know all this time as a developer here, as a developer there, like I don't have that, but um, I think I have these type of different skills and maybe that shapes my work um, a little bit. And then of course, like a really nice, simple geometric sans, um, but again, and then a serif that we've been working on. Um, so again, right down the middle, trying to be like, take these things that we've taken for granted as sort of every day, whether it's like a font like Georgia or Arial or Courier or Futura or um, Century Gothic. And like, how can we reimagine that as something with like care, love and beauty? And that's kind of what I want to sit at the middle of my type foundry. Here's a Roman serif. Here's one we're working on in all caps version for a jazz label in New York. Um, called Nouvelle Records. You guys should all check out. I think they're having a Black Friday sale today, a great artistic jazz label. Um, but the reason we build sort of these really functional typefaces is because we're also interested in this other side of it, where again, this, this kind of sat or is the spark that sat at the center of my, um, my artistic practice really is that like, this is both a shape, like a drawing, in abstraction and represents like a function of carrying the sound ta. And so for me, this, this really was at the basis of a lot of exploration. And like, I also love the fact that it triggers this unicone, unicode, which sends back these vectors, which is this shape. And I think, again, I'm seeing the idea of like translation, repetition and system design right here in this letter. You know, this is abstraction, this is system, this is repetition, this is translation. And specifically, again, I'm really interested in this idea around form. And so like, I'm really into this group called the Russian formalists from the early 1920s that I got interested in and like around the idea of linguistics. And they talk a lot about the specificity and autonomy of poetic language and literature. And so I think when I try to think about type in art, there's two types of language, like the way the, the Roman form, Russian formalists talk about it. They would talk about um, form being a drawing and then, and that's poetic, that's poetic, that's artistic language. And then there's functional language, which is like, it's instructional and it's, it's meant to carry like a function and serve a purpose. And so obviously I'm very interested in the other one. And so for me, I was looking at like typography as abstraction and the creation of digital tools to facilitate this exploration. And so for me, this started when colors were getting into fonts. And so started very simple for me. The first day I saw this go out on Font Lab, I think they were the first to do it, built a typeface just out of color dots. And so the idea here is that A is represented by a teal circle letter A, this is the word hello. And then you can begin to abstract that away. Now we've taken form and content and like the content is still there, but we've gone all the way to form. So this is the October 19th, 2019, I think New York Times set in the dot font. And then we did the entire section and printed it at the exact size. And so for me, again, this is how type always appears to me. This is what I've always been seeing. Type is a painting, form is a painting, information is a painting, structure is a painting. And so 
I think when you can begin to replace the content and say, the content is ready-made art, we're gonna put form on top of it and make an image out of it and ask people to reconsider, that is where like everything is starting to click for me. So then we also made a plugin. So like, this is what Google looks like. This is Craigslist. This is like, I love Domino's pizza. You can see the CSS style sheets being picked up here with the drop shadows on the prices for like $5.99 or whatever. Um, and then we can, we can like, I think I have some of this up. Yeah. So like, you know, you can see here, like, and when you hover over, you know, there's six ninety nine, And so we're picking up like the, the drop shadow. And I really love this idea of like, um, a lot of my work plays around like, like, this sort of resonates in the back of my head, like knowing, not knowing and wanting to know. And I think that like wanting to know what something says or what like, you know, it's a t-shirt or, a, you know, you know, it's a pizza website. You don't know what it says, but you want to know. I think that creates like the viewer to lean in a little bit. And so, you know, these get really interesting. I think when you remove the language, um, same as you, you know, you guys have seen before and, you know, obviously like the beautiful websites look really beautiful um, and they become pieces of art themselves. Um, and then these take on their own vernacular and then things like Craigslist, the structure pushes through and becomes like the really interesting thing. Um, and so there's AOI. I had to, I had to go check that out in the dot font. Things like um, your phone, the calculator and your weather. Um, and so there's a whole nother exploration with the dot font and a bunch of stuff we've done, but want to take you. And so that led to another exploration of like, okay, if, um, if a, if a letter can be abstracted, then like the whole alphabet could be abstracted. And if it could be a dot, it could be a, it could be a square, it could be a triangle, it could be a whatever things with more sides are. Um, and then if a letter could be abstract and so could a word, a sentence, a paragraph, blah, 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 on and on and on. And so this became a really fun tool. And we've had almost like 800 fonts um, generated, I believe. Um, by people. And this came out in 2018. Just to give you an idea of the ghost town that I've been speaking to for a long time of nobody caring. Um, so I'm so happy anytime anybody's interested in the art. Um, but this is really the idea, you know, that you can start here and like this is left justified. Let's make tie faces out of abstract shapes. So you see moving the color around, you can see it responding in real time. You can see playing with saturation. You can add colors here. You can, you know, limit it to one color. If you want to have like a lot of pink in your font, I've had people send me their wedding vows set in the in this stuff. Um, and you can play with, you know, here you can see the resolution is all the way down. There's the full shapes. You can center justified, right justified, vertically justified. We can set it in a circle, like why can't this be a word? We can set it in Z space so that the word comes towards you. Um, and then I think, you know, again, like I'm really into like playing with this idea of resolution. I think like um, this is another vector we should be trading on. And then, you know, this is a sentence. This is, this to me is language. It's also a painting. It's also like a thing and you can download the font. Um, and see all that stuff. I think I have the um, typegen.com archive and you can go see and download a bunch of the typefaces there. Um, give them a second to load. There we go. I would say a good 400 of these are probably me. <laughs> um, you'll see a lot of Martin showing up here. Yeah, I mean, this is how I paint. You know, so I would take this and combine this with a million letters and see what happens, you know. Um, and so you know, let me kind of click through. So here's some of the archive. Again, like I said, I think we have 800 fonts. Here's some specimens we've made. Um, we're looking for a publisher for a type generator cookbook that we've designed where we like lay out the font and how to get it. And then like, this is this is two letters. Here's another alphabet. Here's some more specimen. Here's another alphabet. Here's another like little specimen. 
Um, and again, pushing on this idea of language um, and typography and multiples and translation. Um, I don't know if you guys will be able to hear this. Let me play it and see if you can hear. Um, can you guys hear that at all? No, not really. Um, but I can let share. Me, um, let me share with my sound on real quick. Um, okay. So um, this was the idea of every time you type a message, it it gener it maps it to the Western alphabet. Or sorry, the the Latin alphabet gets mapped to the Western music scale. And it generates both a melody and a chord progression. And you can choose any MIDI instrument to make and key to make your phrase in. So that. Did that play any music? No. Oh, it did. Okay. So that said, hello, my name is Martin. And so um I've been working with these um musicians. Um um, one guy's named Ile Hal. He is the drummer for uh, Robbie Coltrane right now and uh, Christian Scott. And so he, so the idea was to form a band around the idea of language and generative art, basically. And so Arsh, who is hopefully on this call somewhere, amazing developer who I've worked with since 2016. He and I began to build this product and um, started to write a bunch of poems about letters. And so this was a, or about colors, sorry. And so this was the poem about the color green that we then translated into sound. Let's see if I can play it here. So he has connected to um, a multi-instrumentalist, um, a couple different artists. And um, so we've never, you know, a bunch of us have never met each other and we push this music around. And so this is kind of where this one is right now. Those are vocalists singing from the poem and I think that's been in the hands of about seven people right now and then we have one I'll just play you guys a second of this um this is a track called Orange so again this is from the poem and the poem for Orange was when the sunlight and the moonlight mingle and so then that generated Getting MIDI music, which so is just the drummer, and then she needs this and the string arranger. And And so again, to me, this is like freeing language, like decoupling language and meaning, you know, which I, I find really in interesting. So again, here's like, this is sort of, I send them one page of a visual brief. So this is a font I designed for this song to be like part of the visual brief for the musicians. Um, air text and repeat. This is another type tool. This is one of my very favorites. I still don't know exactly what I'm doing here, but again, I think it's the space between form and content. So here we have an image of clouds. So I upload this again, Arsh, if you're out there, Arsh, um, help bring this to life, incredible. 
Um, I don't know why that translate transitions on that slide, but so what you're seeing here is uploading that image and then it's mapping it to a typeface and creating a typeface on the bottom out of that image. So you see those colors evenly dispersed between the typeface and then redrawing the image out of type. So both images you see on that screen are typography, um, just rebuilt pixel by pixel. And so um, we can hop out here and go into, uh-oh. <laughs> Sorry, I've gone black one second. I'll have to relaunch my, my keynote, um, but let me reshare my screen. Um, well, while you do this, um, we have a question from Lars, Lars Wonder. Um, yep. One second, it might get lost in the chat. Where is it? Mm -mm. Disha, help me out. There's so many messages in the chat. <laughs> Lars would like to know, Marty, what are your thoughts on monospace fonts? I love them. <laughs> I love them. And this one right here is the one we, this is our typeface, 188 mono for sale at Future Fonts for a reasonable price. Go pick one up. Um, or Lars, I'll just send it to you. Um, I love mono. I mean, again, I like rules. You know, I like being told you can't do this. And so again, so you can see here, so this is just the typography mapped. And so um, over here, this image is being made out of type. And so this again, when you're like, how do you paint? How do you make art? So this image right here, I would scoop this up and go into something like pages. Um, here's like a painting and Let's see, let me see. So give my computer a minute to freak out, but it'll get there eventually, show you guys kind of how I work. Um, so again, I really love using tools in ways that maybe they like feels a little weird um, or in terms of like painting in, in something like pages. So this is now the typography from the right side of that image. And so I would go to like one point type and so this is 300,000 characters. And, and then these are like, um, you know, some abstract typefaces. So like this is, uh, this is made out of squ uh, Chrome squiggle, this typeface. And so here is, this is the picture of those clouds um, as a piece of text. And so this gets super interesting to me where it's like both an image and a text but it's an image describing an image. I don't know, it's text as an image describing an image. I think I love this ambiguity and like how, like I think for dyslexics, um, language is negotiable. And so I like that as an idea. Um, Gil Gershoni, who's like, um, I do, do some panels with and he has like this thing on dyslexic thinking. He always says language is negotiable. And I like that as a way of, of thinking about it. And so we can probably, even if we come in here and um, make this 11 by 17, we may be able to like even just go recreate the clouds. So if we come in here and like, I think I, so here's the cloud typography and let it give it a second to switch. Oh, wait, I didn't highlight it. There we go. So that's setting that in type in pages. And so for me, this is super, this is, I love this. This is like, well, is it text or is it image or is it image made from text about an image? Or is it like, this is to me is the confusion that I like. Um, and I think they're just as beautiful when you start making paintings out of them you know and i i like making work where it's like uh, this maybe is a square this is maybe like a square that i turned into text and i like this act of even being able to go in and you know just be like okay i want to change the painting completely and so now i choose a new font and maybe we there that's it switched and then maybe we choose um if this is 11 by 17 let's make it letter 
And again, I think there's a familiarity here and something that like my, you know, every, people get, people understand word, MS word, people understand um, these types of things. And then I think my last type tool that I was going to show, and if I'm going too question, long. Martin. Um, yeah. I have a question, Martin. I have a question because I remember we were, we were talking about how, um, I mean, you showed us the, the picture of the clouds. You were telling me you take pictures of like water and flowers. Um, and so I was interested to know if, um, do you spend like a lot of time in nature? Is this something that usually inspires you as well? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love, I, I mean, I'm like one of those, um, <laughs> you know, I think my family thinks like a little crazy, like sort of like taking picture of the grass or, I mean, it's like every artist you have on these things where it's like, I took pictures of the water for three hours and I was really fascinated by the light bouncing off of it or whatever. And I think that like type has always been that extra thing for me where, um, you know, I can be fascinated walking around the mall. I think a lot of the work I do is commercial work, you know, that like, you know, I mean, I designed the Twitter logo. We all logged on to there this morning. That was designed as a letter. And I think that like, um, I think I'm I'm just as fascinated by lowercase e as I am by like um, a, a large scale painting or something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was I was going to put Leticia on the spot about this when she comes back because she also um, has this uh, this style in in her art, like this approach as well, of like um, spending a lot of time in front of like water, right, Leticia? I'm sorry. Um, say that again. <laughs> I was distracted by the system that's breaking down in my house while we're down here. So uh, go ahead, go ahead. Please, please uh, ask again. No, I was just saying um, what Marty was telling me. It kind of reminds me of, of what you do as well. Your approach of like staying put in a in a spot or or t taking some time in front of like water or whether it's it's something that gets your attention, right? So I was I was thinking yeah. about that. And constraints, I think, um, you know, when you when you put constraints on yourself, there's something magical that happens. Uh, and uh, I put a really on paper, a, a constraint that that's really quite ridiculous. <laughs> so I've never really talked about it, but um, but um, it was it was related to the life as well. So life putting constraints on me and then me putting constraints on the process. And after that, something happens where you're like, I would have never thought that this was come up. So it's kind of gener generated by the process and by the constraints. And I think um, that's that's something that's underestimated from a lot of creative uh, people, the power of constraints and what happens when you, when you succumb to that, which is very difficult because you want to break out. So there was also a period of times. And I'm wondering, actually, thank you for asking that, Federica, because now I, I want to ask Martin, um, do, you, do you have moments where you want to break out of that constraint and you're tired of it and and does anything ha interesting happen if you persist like when you go beyond that okay i've done this a hundred times like what can possibly happen if i do it the hundred and once time and then something happens could you share a bit of of that yeah i mean i think i'm, I'm a hyper obsessive person so i think it's not like a hundred it'll be like ten thousand you know that type of a thing and then you start to go like i think yeah i, I mean you want to break things i think it's that's the, I mean, going back to that first slide, it's like when the S gets kicked down to the next line, that's when I'm interested. I mean, like even an eight and a half by 11 paper with a color font is really interesting to me. Like, and the most interesting part is the bottom of the page because the printer doesn't know what to do. Like, do I stack this font on top of this type on top of the letters or do I create a white space and go down to the next line? And I think like that is, that is what, that's life. You know, I think it's like those little, like the printer doesn't know what to do. And I mean, I've heard like all the generative artists talk about like that moment where the machine has to break or be human or that. I just like, you know, I don't use a plotter. I like a Xerox laser printer or something like that. Like I like, I like rules. I like corporations. I mean, Tony knows my fondness for, I really want to create an art company that's all just corporate structures as art. Like I don't, I want the art to be the corporate structure and um, make abstract um, articles of incorporation and send people um, statements, you know, and have classes of shareholders. I love rules. I love structure. I mean, I think a lot of my art is saying like, look at the structure. 
Look at how beautiful the structure of language is, the structure of news, the structure of color. And look, even with something like squares or tennis, I mean, those are both structural projects. I'm saying like the color changes due to the structure. And here's where the structure changes. And this is where the color changes. And same with tennis. I mean, I'm, it's a container. We've like just filled the container with color. Um, and so that, you know, that's, um, I, I, yeah, I mean, I love rules. I don't like, I don't really like projects without rules. I think they lead me to make a million iterations that live only on my laptop. And so art blocks having a small file size or no dependency or, you know, the, the things we've had to configure to for tennis have made the project what it is as much as the act of whatever creativity, like the the constraints make it as much of what it is. And I think it's really fun. I like working on teams where there's deadlines in real life. Cause otherwise, I mean, you just paint and make stuff forever. And like, no one ever gets to see it and it never goes out and never gets finished. Absolutely. Um, so we have um, a couple of comments from the community. They really want to know about the ATP project. So yep, I would yep. love to give you sure. uh, perhaps just like one minute um, break <laughs> since you've been you've been uh, sharing and and, and uh, speaking a lot. We can give you a little break in the meantime. I would love to start with Tony and Mark um, for you guys to tell us how the collaboration started and. Tell us about the project. Maybe Tony, you want to start with that? Sure. Well, I think that Mark might be best suited because he is from the ATP and, you know, they they sought out an artist to work with them on the project and paired up with Marty for a reason. So I'd love to hear Mark speak on why they chose Marty. And I think he's got a great backstory to that. So I'll let him take the floor. Yeah, 100%. Thanks, Tony. Um, I guess as an introduction, you know, we, for those of you who don't know, we're the global tennis tour, the ATP. We look after the men's professional players, right from the world number one down through the rankings. And we have a, a global tour that runs from January through November. We play in 60 countries and we have a really global fan base. And I guess our journey started like most sports, kind of March 2021, seeing, you know, NBA success with top shots. And we spent a really, really long time trying to understand what our first play would be in the Web3 space. And uh, we ultimately decided that we'd love to do something involving digital art and something that was based around uh, our, our year-end event, which is the Need to HP Finals. And, uh, you know, this is the, the flagship for our tour. It's, it's the top eight players in the world. It actually just finished on Sunday. So our season is officially wrapped. And, you know, I think it's safe to say we're still finding our feet in, in Web3. And, you know, despite that, we, we knew a number of things. We wanted to keep our first play very simple. We wanted to use data because tennis is a very data-rich sport. And we also wanted to work with the best. I think there have been so many stories of sports teams jumping in with uh, various providers across the different Web3 use cases. And uh, yeah, we really wanted to work with the most reputable players in the space. So we started in September. Marty was just talking about um, tight deadlines. And my word, we've been working to some pretty tight deadlines on this on this project. So approached Artblocks in September and they went out to their community and came back with some unreal pictures from different artists. All very different. Some more simplistic, some more complex. But the standout from that group was by far and away Marty and his vision for, for love. I think what, what immediately attracted us to Marty was just the sort of the simplicity and the, you know, the, the striking beauty of, of the artwork. I think when you look at it, you immediately know it's tennis. And, you know, this was, this was really important for us because, you know, I'd probably venture to say that our fan base maybe isn't the most Web3 savvy, and we wanted something that was very accessible to them. So, so the beauty was what first caught us, but but then actually it was Marty's energy and, and the team's passion for the sport that really, really caught us. Marty actually was so excited by the project that he didn't just submit one pitch, but but two. And uh, he he admitted at the start of this that he actually wasn't able to sleep because he had so many creative ideas. And, you know, he's... 
he's been true to that word. He, his team is absolutely amazing. They're super professional. Um, they've been so, so creative. And, and for us, what was really important is that the tennis fan was kept top of mind throughout it all, which was awesome. Um, I've certainly got a newfound appreciation for the art world and the digital art world and the sort of the ethos um, and all the sort of craft behind it. Um, and yeah, I think the output, outputs look absolutely unreal. Uh, they drop on December 6th. Um, and we couldn't be more excited to see the, the artwork go out into the wild. Thank you, Mark. That's absolutely beautiful. And um, Martin, you were telling me the other day that um, for you, it's like sport is like another door to art, right? So what was that excited you the most about this project? I mean, I, I really do love tennis. I love sports. Um, I, particularly, I love basketball and tennis. Um, and so when I saw this, I was um, super excited um, to be able to even have a shot at, at, you know, pitching. And I, again, I really love art that exists in the real world and that people can relate to. I think that um, you know, I've even had uh, experiences where like I didn't go into a art gallery because um, sort of felt intimidated. Um, like, uh, I've, I know I'm not going to buy anything. Um, I don't even know how to ask for prices, like all that type of a thing. And so I really like where we can like take art and put it into real world experiences and let people, um, there's not a real abstraction to wade through. If there is, I think it's pretty immediate. Like, these are abstractions of tennis, but I think when you get down to like, like, hey, we 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 want to interact with the sport and the players in the court. And so like where the ball hits, we mark it. And then we give it a shadow and a level of zoom. And you know, I know color. I'm super good at color. Okay, now we're gonna color the now we're gonna color the court. And then again, like call on Arsh and Lax and Audrey and the team and sort of say, Okay, can we can we build in an algorithm? Can we build in logic where the court always detects where the camera detects always at least one line? So that now we've got like this is a very formal design exercise. You know, I was saying like a circle, an oval, two fields of color, and possibly like a line, maybe more. But I think when you add it all up, it's like it's a really compelling visual. And then I think when you ground it in the real world, I think this just gives everybody like especially people who don't love art, it gives them a door to walk in in terms of like when somebody's asking you what this art is, you're not trying to explain that, you know, oh, it's a series of squares that layer on top of each other to form a piece of cut. Like, no, it's like, this is a, this is a shot. This is my favorite player. This is the game winning shot. This is a forehand down the line in the Nitto finals, whatever. And it just really contextualizes. And I think I feel like we're all in some way or another working on this idea of trying to bring as much people into the space to get excited about the art as we can. And so to me, this is a really straightforward way of being, do you like sports? Do you like tennis? Do you see this? This is art. How would you feel about having that in your house? Or at least telling somebody about it or talking about it or thinking about it. That's, you know, that's the role of the work. That's beautiful. And, and ultimately, it's almost like, you know, you're trying to, again, take a system in this case, like a, a language sport and, and kind of like redo it again, uh, rebuild it. Uh, I know we don't have too much time, but is there any way we can see a little bit of the behind the scenes of how you make this? The tennis one? Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Um, shoot, where did um, we've lost our, um, hold on. I think I might have to type in this shadow helper. Okay, so let's see. Um, all right, here we go. And I don't know if Arsh is in here, if he wants to talk at all, but Arsh and Lax are the, the geniuses that help, and Audrey, that help build all this. And like Mark said, this has been an insane amount of work, but, um, you know, we, we um, you can generate a point and this is basically using real data. And this shows sort of the behind the scenes. And um, this, this is what we get. We get an X and a Y coordinate. And they, these are all the shadow angles that are going around. These are the camera angles that are going around the camera for each shot, each time it lands. 
This was the hardest part of this project, getting the shadow to work the way I drew it. Because again, I drew this as a type designer, not as the way a shadow would look with real light shined on it, shown. I don't know what the right word is there, but you can see um, this was, you know, hours and hours and hours of shadow design um, that had gone in here. And then you can zoom out to see the field of view, the level of zoom, um, the offset amount uh, that's moving the ball inside um, the off. This is the, our offset angle. And I can dip into a little bit of our, um, some of my tests um, here and show you guys. Um, I, I'd also add Marty, like just for anyone who's not aware, like this whole thing is based off real world data actually from our, our tournament. And I mentioned earlier in the call, but, you know, we have so much data that we produce from every individual tennis match. We have, you know, 10 cameras around the court that track the ball and the player location every 0.02 seconds or something like that. So you can really sort of tell the story of the tournament and the action through data. And it allows us to go in and pick out some really cool points like the championship winning points or match winning points or the fastest forehand, the biggest serve, things like that. So that's where the, all this data yep. is, is driven from. Um, and then, so you can see here. Field day with the, with all the the data here. Everyone's um, in the yeah. that point. <laughs> someone is asking how many pieces are in the collection. 300, uh, 285 actually, because 15 are reserved for the ATP. Um, Anyway, Which they you can see will be purchasing, but they so technically, yes, it is a collection of 300, but 284 will be available for purchase because Mint Zero also goes to Marty. Um, but anyway, you can see here, there's a shot right there, like there's our overhead shot, and then that's the actual render. Um, so the camera again going through all those decisions. Anyway. What else can I answer about tennis or is that? Um, we were also, I wanted also for you to mention um, about the prints. I know there's a part about prints, right? Um, in this collection. Yeah, there'll be prints available on um, level frames and it'll be token gated. So um, you can redeem your prints. Um, I've, I've got a print off level frames. It was very easy and I think quite affordable. Um, mm -hmm. If anybody's really into a silk screen, I would be totally interested in silk screening some of these. So if, if a collector out there wants to do some silk screens, I would be interested in silk screening some of these. I think they would turn out amazing. Um, Marty, you already know I'm going for that silk screen. <laughs> um, but yeah, prints are available. And actually I should also say, um, I'm headed over to uh, Oakland today to sign um, some squares and get them out in the mail. And the high res prints of that are looking incredible so some pictures of that will come today and um if anybody wants prints of that i think we finally got that rolling um in a way it's harder than everybody thinks that's all i'll say like getting prints done is like there's 30 questions at every stop so appreciate everybody's patience but the first batch is going out today and i can't wait to see them i'll post some pictures that's awesome. That's really great. Thanks, everyone. Um, so we have a lot of incredible comments. Uh, everyone's saying we love this collection. This collection is so special and creative. Um, someone said, I want to cover my wall with this tennis art. So that's really nice. Um, so we don't have any more questions at the moment. I see that Luke is typing and Psycho is also typing. If there's any questions, please send them out uh, right now because we are a little bit over the time. Um, okay, so Luke is saying, uh, is saying thoughts on points on relationship between language of code and output. To me, I love the idea that they're equals. I mean, I, I know that other places have done this and put a lot of thought into this of, um, you know, like, hey, here's the image, here's the code. And I think that like, again, those are translations. That's a form of multiples. I think, um, you know, Warhol would always, like we think of multiples in the context of Warhol's like different size or different color. But I think that like text is image. I think, you know, and for me that sits at the middle of a lot of this stuff. And I think that like, 
if one is a recipe and one is the meal, like to me, they're the same thing, just at different stages. And so I want to continue to explore, you know, how do you continue to elevate that code expression? Um, you know, it's like this, this type up here that those dots up there in the top, that's the, um, the U S tax code section 1.1 a of the U S tax code at 40 point in dot font. And I want to look at like making both like a long form tapestry version of that. And then also like a, a book that's like 4,000 pages long that no one could read made out of all dots. Um, but yeah, I mean, I love to me that space in between. Well, what's different about these? That, that to me is the cool part. Thank you. And thanks Luke for the question. Uh, we also had a question about uh, the mint price, but Tony is replying about this in the chat. If everyone is um, interested, I uh, see that Luke is typing again. So if anything, I'll just. Well, I think it's helpful, I think it's helpful uh, if we speak it out here on the, the mint. Go ahead, please. Uh, yeah. So it'll be a Dutch auction. It'll last 30 minutes. We'll be starting at 3 E and resting at 0 0.3. So you'll have a choice of when to enter the auction and, you know, it's a bear market. Maybe you'll get that Black Friday deal. We'll see. <laughs> All right. This is, this is incredible. And I love how we, we were able to really see all of this all of this journey that you've been doing, um, you know, from typography to this this project specifically i feel like we can really tell that um your your approach to work right you just you take a system and, and you really like look at it from such a genius perspective it's like you really look at all the smaller details um and and kind of like rebuild them again it's absolutely incredible like i'm mind blown by this session it's it's been really great um we have some more comments coming in it's wonderful amazing <laughs> thanks everyone um, okay. I think, that was, I think that it was really important that we had this talk today because, you know, Marty's work is it's beautiful, right? I mean, squares are breathtaking, but on their face, they're they're quite simple. It's a square. With the Love Collection, it's a tennis court. And the thing that I love that everyone seems to connect with, I've shown test outputs to friends and family and people that have never wanted and an NFT before are like, okay, how do I get an Ethereum wallet? Because I want one of these. You know, they're so, they resonate with everyone. But today we got to have a peek behind the curtains and see Marty's process. And, you know, on its face, it's not what it really is. You know, there's so much, so, so much that goes into all of this, you know, and I think that we got a nice little sneak peek here. And I'm just glad that, you know, you had the opportunity to share that and that everyone can see what we see that, you know, Marty is a genius for content's purposes. So yeah, I'm really glad that you all connected with the work as well. And Marty, I know you're a humble guy, but someone's got to say it and you're a genius. <laughs> I, I, I'll echo that as well, Tony. I mean, whenever I've showed the artwork internally at, at the tour, I mean, amongst our, our team who aren't Web3 natives, I'll admit it. They've all said, like, this is unreal. How do we get a wallet? How do we buy one? How do we get one in the office? So I agree. I mean, I would love this to be the sort of gateway into Web3 for tennis fans and really get them excited about the space. And um, yeah, I'm just so excited for it to drop. And I just I want to thank I want to thank I want to thank you guys for having us on in AOI for letting us come share work and talk a lot. I apologize for I get super worked up about typography and art, so appreciate you um, letting us share work and uh, want to thank Mark and Tony as well and uh, Sophia who's not on the call. Um, just She's such a fun opportunity. Oh, she <laughs> is amazing so mm -hmm. fun to work on this project and like mark said the amount of work that has gone into it on everybody's end uh has been insane and i think that uh the twitter community for generative art and like um artx code and you guys uh and everyone who joins these calls i join them for other artists and everything i think uh i really want to say thank you because 
for so long making art with like you know just like if a tree falls in the woods and no one hears it what is that saying something like that like that was me making art and i just think to be able to participate in talks like this to work with the atp um to work with arsh and lakshan and audrey and everybody i just honestly feel you know so lucky and um so massive thank you to you guys for helping to build the culture and promote it and have um conversations like this thank you so thank you and and it's actually you know it's the the whole purpose of the reason why the masterclass is um really started was for this we were like you know we're so passionate about this art we want to really help people to connect with it um because sometimes you know it's understandable that people still have a little bit of skepticism and and there's still a lot of you know judgment towards like oh it's just a machine and so these sessions are really about going beyond the machine or even behind you know who's mm -hmm. the person mm -hmm. behind this who's the soul who's the concept who's the mind like what's going on um what's going on behind the scenes what's going on behind the machine and um really the relationship between the human and the machine as well is really what we want to uh, convey to people. So um, this session has been so amazing, incredible. Uh, so honored to have you with us today. And Tony, Mark as well, thank you so, so much for being with us. Um, sorry that we went a little bit over time, but it was worth it. <laughs> we really didn't want to stop the session. <laughs> I could listen to Marty talk for hours. So always yeah. appreciate for allowing me to go. I appreciate it. I know I went on and on, but anyone who, ever wants to talk art, reach out on Twitter, Discord, or whatever. I'm always happy to chat with anybody about this stuff. And so um, reach out, happy to chat about squares, tennis, type, <laughs> art, color, anything. Awesome, that's beautiful. And for everyone who's in the call on our Discord channel, thank you so much for being with us. Um, we can continue the conversation on our generative lounge uh, channel. So join us there. We can still chat over there about the work. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much, Leticia, as well, for being with me all the time, yeah, helping. <laughs> thanks, everyone, again. Thanks, Federico. Thank thank you. So much. And guys, next week, come back next week for oh, <laughs> was that it? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make myself worth, worth the, the worth the. <laughs> worth the while uh so um come back next week there's there's many many more who's who's on next week uh, can we already reveal yeah. it's melissa Videres. she might be in the audience right now she is she, she is oh. she was before is she still around i think awesome hi melissa <laughs> see you next week <laughs> So we had an amazing crowd tonight. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out. So yeah, next week, uh, come back, same place. I think same, same time, mm -hmm. probably. Uh, um, lots more going on. In the meantime, we've got the AOI workshops. Uh, the prompt is coming out tomorrow. And guess what? I'm going to be inspired by what we saw today. So thank you, Marty, for uh, giving me something to work with. Uh, so you're all going to be informed tomorrow if you want to participate. I know some of you do that are in the audience um and uh, and more things coming also check out the twitter spaces there is so much going on right now we we uh we are back we are back on track mm -hmm. and uh, federica is absolutely hyperactive at the moment so uh, check it all out I'm, Join always, us. I'm always online <laughs> so i'm always <laughs> Um, so there's a Twitter space tomorrow. Join us. There's Twitter spaces Monday to Friday, except for Wednesday when we do the master classes. Uh, but you can also re-watch and re-listen to the episodes on our AY Spotify, which you can find on our uh, Twitter account. So please make sure you subscribe and leave some likes as well. Okay, I think we did everything about the housekeeping part. All good? <laughs> yes, we did. Yes, we did. Awesome. Okay, thank you so much again, everyone. Thank you, Martin, Mark, and Tony. Thank you so, so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye, you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the AOI streams. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a like and subscribe to listen to more stories from the pioneers of the ecosystem.